You're listening to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast, episode 22. Welcome to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast, where positivity and spirituality create an enhanced life's journey with the wisdom of Ifa and Arisha. I am your host, Iya Omileti Olubumi. Welcome to the Arisha Wisdom Podcast. I am Iya Omileti. Thank you for spending some of your time with me to talk about all things Arisha, spirituality, and growth. So grab a cup of coffee or juice, put on your sunglasses while you drive, or pop in your earbuds so that we can chat. Today's episode is being brought to you by our very own Orisha Wisdoms or Reaffirmations. Do you want to know what Ori is? Want to connect with your Ori? This is a free resource available just for you. So go to www.orishawisdom.com forward slash Ori1, that's O-R-I and the number one. This is the third installment of Ask a Priest series on the Orisha Wisdom Podcast, and I am just stoked about the response that we have received. For those of you who are new to the podcast, Ask a Priest is a series on the podcast which is directly working with you, the community. Coming into the traditions can be a bit, well, a bit hard, scary, and a whirlwind. And what is bound to come about? Questions, of course, and more questions. So I created a series called Ask a Priest, where you get to write one of your burning questions about the Arisha traditions, and then there is a chance that your question will be answered here on the podcast. I hope that you enjoyed this mini episode, and with that, let's get this going. Nell Africa asks, I want to know how priests have handled issues of ostracism, marginalization from others because they are part of this spirituality. How do they deal with Christian friends and family members and others who aren't educated on this spirituality who try to demonize it? And how are some ways that us newbies can navigate coming into the spirituality without feeling the need to hide what we do? First of all, Nell, thank you so much for submitting your question. And whoa, that is a loaded question, but oh, such a good one. I'll provide a simple response to each of these based on personal experience and the experiences of other priests consulted with for this question. With that, here it goes. On the part of how have priests handled issues of being ostracized because they're part of this spirituality and especially dealing with others who are from the Christian faith, who are not educated into our ways and they try to demonize us. So we're going to tackle that bit. There are a million ways of responding to this question as each person handles Christians and others who dislike our traditions differently. Also, how you deal with it may be where you are in your spiritual journey and based on your temperament and based on the lessons that you need to learn. When I first started, I didn't care who knew and I actually loved capital loved freaking people out and having them scared out of their minds of what I could do with some African magic. (laughs) Oh, don't judge me. I was 20 years old. I played on the fear factor that TV played out in all those episodes really well to freak people out. And I was okay with that at that point. As the years went by, it started to get very real when I was dating and meeting new people at public events. 
and didn't know what to say. I would say something like, I'm a spiritual person and I don't follow any denomination. Honestly, I was scared that they would find out and judge me with their judgy eyes and have their judgy talks after I turned around. Time passed again, and I realized that I don't have to hide. And as priests, we are here to serve our community, and we have to be examples. Now, this did not originate from me, but the teachings of our Egbe. So kudos to the elders there. Woot, woot. My approach has since changed, and I'm not trying to figure out how I can scare or just give them the shock factor, but really to adhere to the teachings of Ifa. Ifa says, we all come from one. So, after some time and asking others, I got some bullets for you. Number one, know your tradition. Study it. Because if you know what you're speaking of, it will be a scholarly discussion when explaining it. If you are new, do not engage in any discussion and direct them to somebody that you know, like a godparent or an elder, if you have one. If you do not have one, a simple response can be, you know what, I'll get back to you later on that. I'll, I'll get back to you. Another point is, if you're a veteran and not a newbie, meaning that you have been here for a while, you know the traditions, you are living them, you are part of a community, you have elders to talk with, you know what? Be ready to explain it. And it is best to find common ground. For example, one of my quick faves are, well, your religion says that you should believe in a higher power, God Almighty, right? And usually they nod, they say yes, so do I. Your religion says that you must strive to be a good person. You know, not kill, steal puppies, steal, rob banks, right? And they nod. So does mine. So if you start finding a common ground, they may be more receptive to listen to what you have to say. They may not agree with it, but they'll be more receptive. Number two, some people are just not ready to listen to someone else who is in a different place than they are. And you have to be ready and okay to accept that. Some people are just not ready, even if you are enlightened and everything is working out for you and you have worked out a lot of things, they just might not be ready. You have to be okay with that. Number three. Show by your actions that you are not a devil worshiper, a demon, or evil on earth. Wahahaha, <laughs> evil laugh. Your actions will make people question their own beliefs. I'm going to give you a couple of points. Know that if you bleed, so do they. They have challenges just like you do. If you're a parent, then the love for your children is the same love for their children, if they have children. Focus more on what you have in common when it comes to showing your life versus in what you differ from them and be an example in your community. It's kind of hard to demonize a person who will help another human being when they're in trouble. Participate in your community. Volunteer your time. Help your neighbors. Uh, actively work each day to be a good person. If you have young children, participate in your children's classroom activities. I have a story for you. My husband has been in these traditions since he was a child. He was raised in these traditions. His aunt, one of his aunts, is very, very religious. And she is in one of those Christian denominations, and they were having this big 
you know, prayer where people talk and then you have to testify, right? And they were saying that all santeros are evil and santeros are the devil and santeria is the work of the demon here on earth and da 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 So you can imagine. And people are like, amen, yes, Jesus, that's right, save us all. And that uh, we should not associate with them. And uh-huh. His aunt raised her hand. And she stood up and, of course, you know, the pastor or deacon or whoever was speaking was probably like, yes, you know, we're going to hear about an experience. And what she said was interesting. She said, you know, my nephew is a santero. He's been one for many years. And he's a great person. He is very helpful. He's one of the best human beings that I have ever met. He's not doing bad things for people. If I were to be in trouble with anything, if a pipe were to break in my house or whatever, he would come out and help without an issue. He has a lovely family. He is a very family person. And I don't think that this view on Santeria is entirely true. I don't want to share half of that story because I would love for him one day to share it with you all. But I'll give you that. It made her change her mind of Santeria when people even in her own church were demonizing our traditions. And just think about it. She's a respected parishioner in that church. And she just stood up and defended her nephew in front of everyone. And I know that everyone was silent. Your ex the point that I'm trying to make is that your example will be and can be a key to change other people's minds. Number four, set barriers kindly and respectfully. A saying that I have that has morphed over time, I guess. It's something along the lines of, I am respectful of other people's beliefs. If that is what helps them to be a good person, then I respect that, and I expect the same respect in return. Something along those lines. So if you like it, kind of make that yours. But that one has been very helpful to create a gentle barrier so that they're not pushing their beliefs onto you. If they push a little bit more and they're a lot pushier and they're able to kind of go beyond that barrier that you've put, I will say something along the lines of, I'm not trying to convert anyone. And I expect the same courtesy because I am respectful of other people's beliefs. Usually by then they're like, oh yeah, this person cannot be saved. Oh, please help them. But usually they'll back up and they will be a little more respectful of the barrier so that they're not pushing their beliefs on you. Number five, they can smell fear. <laughs> I'm trying to do an evil laugh. It's probably not coming out evil at all. <laughs> but really, they can smell fear. They can tell if you're scared or you're in hiding or you're hiding something. This is your path. If they strongly believe that you are the devil, then this is what they believe. You have to be okay with that. Your conviction must really show. And your behavior and life changes. That's what's more important. Your behavior and life changes will speak volumes. One way to put it is like this. Have you ever been in love before? Nod, most of us have. You know the feeling. No one had to tell you that you were in love but you knew it through and through. You knew it. You knew it when you got up. You knew it as you walked around. You dazed away. You just knew it. And if that wasn't enough, the whole world knew it as well. 
If anyone tried to tell you that your love interest was this or that, you were not about to hear it because you're in love and you love that person and nobody can say anything about that person. Remember that? Well, same here. This is your tradition that you have embraced and this is it, period. There is no discussion. I am not swaying. This is it. This is what I believe in. I feel it. This has changed my life. I see the world differently and I don't care about anything else, period. So people will be able to see that. They have to be able to see your conviction. So here's another point to that. Others may challenge you. You have to be ready for that challenge in return, but not in a confrontational way, but more of a conviction and educational way as you go along. I'm about to get really, really personal here. Some of you may know or not, my parents are Seventh-day Adventists. And that is how I grew up. Not a secret. It's quite an interesting tradition. And my father once told me that I was going to go to hell if I didn't come back unto the Lord. Mind you, I'm an adult, married, with children, and frankly, I could care less what he was saying. And I was about to go into my old ways, talking about, you know, all those other things I used to say when I was 20. I had to take a deep breath to think. And this came up, oh, ma ferefungo re for this one. I calmly and slowly brought out my two hands. I told him, on one you can have me going to church every Saturday, listening to the Sabbath, and doing all the things that you do in church. But I hate you. I hate me. I hate everybody. Frankly, suicide wouldn't be a bad thing. Or two, I pointed to the other hand. I brought up my other hand wide open. You can have this version of me. I'm a priestess of Arisha. I am married. I'm not single and miserable because I hate everyone, including me. I have children. I help out in my community. I am full of life. I'm quite happy-go-lucky, and I'm improving each day to be a better version of me. Then I lifted out both hands in front of him. You know, like you're juggling. Which one do you want? because you cannot have them both. I remember still holding out my two hands, you know, in the juggling form. You know, my father never answered me that day. His silence said it all. It was just, that didn't work for me. It just didn't. I hate it. By the time that Friday morning hit, I knew that it was going to be Sabbath that evening. I was already in I hate you mode. I hated going to church. I hated the politics there. I hated having to dress up and pretend something that I just wasn't. I hated coming home. I hated not watching my shows on Saturday morning. I hated it. I hated pretending to not have friends that were not in the religion when I did, and I really liked them, and I enjoyed their company, and I thought they were good people, and the church was telling me that everybody else was bad except anybody who was in that room. I hated it. And I had found something that I love waking up in the morning, unless I'm sick, but that's a different story. I love how I have turned out, and I love just the prospect of what I am going to turn out, because I have another way that works for me. So I was able to kind of, with my changes in life, challenge him and say, hey, you really want me to go to church and possibly lose a daughter? Or do you want to have this one that's alive and well and helpful and just, man, this is much more awesome than this one. And he never responded. When they challenge you, 
if you're a priest, then I would do so with prudence versus harsh words. I've seen some priests go into bad language with their family over these traditions. And sadly, this just proves their point, the other people's point, that you are in a bad tradition. So I strongly advise to steer away from arguing, yelling, raising your voice, cursing, throwing things, throwing punches, throwing chairs, throwing anything across the room, your behavior and persona is going to be judged and they're going to be observing. So you don't want to give them extra ammunition. So when they challenge you, if you're a priest, be more on the educative level or put up your barriers. And if you cannot handle a certain situation, it's still good to say, you know what? I'll get back to you. And even if you are a priest, seek other priests to see how would be a good way to respond. We are moving on to number six. Be prepared to lose some family and friends. This is very real. And there is a very big possibility that your family may shun you if they're really, or your friends, if they're really, really into their traditions or religion, you have to be prepared to deal with this. Most of the time, they do come around eventually because of their love for you. But this is something that you have to be ready and prepared for. And no matter how many times you listen to this episode, you will not be totally ready when it happens, if it does, and most likely it will. Parents shun their children. Children stop speaking to their parents. Siblings disappear. And oh my God, friends, run for the hills. And at job functions, some people may steer clear of you. I have a funny story for you. When I was a Yawo in New York City, I worked in Midtown and I had to dress in white. And yes, I went into a very corporate situation, dressed in white, headdress, full head to toe, white bag, white heels, everything, everything. It wasn't really high heels. It was very short heels and it was a, it was godmother approved. But I worked there and there was a colleague who used to speak about me by a certain nickname that he had given me. And the nickname was the Voodoo Princess. Well, first of all, you know that I'm not into voodoo on, voodoo on anything, but I remember that when I first heard of it, I responded knowing that it would get back to him. I said something along the lines of, I'm not into voodoo, on, but I know that it's a beautiful religion and I know many people there. I can gladly introduce him to a few of those priests. Funny, those rumors after that, they, they quickly stopped. And then when I was also a Yawo, there was a new person who came to work uh, in the company and she avoided my gaze. Like she would, if I were to ask her a question, she would kind of like look down and look away. And later on, I was told that she said that the reason why she wouldn't look into my eyes is because I was going to put a hex on her. And I'm like, oh, geez, really? But that's, that's some of the experiences of what you may encounter. And you have to be astute on how you are going to handle them because you are, you're there and people are going to look at you as their example versus just TV. There you go. There are six quick points with a couple of things in there to help you deal with the ostracizing from others with different spiritual beliefs. And if they really persist with the devil thing, then you know what? Tell them that you don't believe in the devil. We don't believe in that. And make it enjoyable and understand that there may be a time that they can come around later. So try to keep things more on a positive level, even if it's a heavy discussion, because we're still humans and we want to maintain our human connection with our community and our family and our friends. I hope 
that you enjoyed today's Ask a Priest episode. Liked it? Hated it? Let me know by leaving a comment and, of course, by sharing it. I would also like to ask if you have just five minutes, please leave me a review on iTunes or whatever platform you're listening to, as it is really helpful into keeping the Orisha Wisdom podcast on the map and letting me know how you are enjoying things. Do you have a burning question that you've been dying to ask an Orisha priest? Send me an email at light at orishawisdom.com or pop into our Facebook group called the Orisha Wisdom Community and ask it there. Don't worry, you do not need to write any of this down right at the second. It will be in the show notes. For the show notes, go to orishawisdom.com forward slash 22, just the number 22. Stay tuned for the next episode where we will be discussing what it takes to keep the Orisha traditions alive. I am definitely looking forward to that episode. Remember also to go to orishawisdom.com forward slash Ori1 to get your Ori affirmations because bringing to your life, the power of Ofo Ashe. It is just a translation that means power of the word. That knowledge can really, really change your life. Until next time, may the elevated ancestors and all Orisha bless you immensely. Odabo! Thank you for listening to the Orisha Wisdom Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes at orishawisdom.com forward slash podcast. Can't get enough of Orisha Wisdom? Check us out at orishawisdom.com and subscribe to our community. Remember, the wisdom of Ifa and Orisha is all around us. Be blessed and until next time.